took your Upanishad, which we did, 12 verses, um, by Gaudapada, who is considered to be Shankara's Guru's Guru, Param Guru. It's about a thousand pages of Karika, the commentary. Many people who read that think that he was a Buddhist. Because it's so, so, so close, it's so, so very close to the descriptions. Uh, I think, I'm nobody to say this, but I think Buddha was kind of rebelling against the, the established orthodoxy. So much so that he got fed up that Sanskrit is being used as an exclusive language and he said, let all our teachings be in the Prakrit, local language. It was, a, it was a great rebel of that time, just as Jesus was a great rebel at that time. So whenever there is something original coming, you will see this change happening. No more controversy, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You um, described in your book, but also mentioned it briefly today, the black or the snake around Krishna. Not Krishna, Shiva. <laughs> uh, as a symbol of wisdom or divine knowledge. Um, like in, if we look at it in the Christian tradition, in the story of Adam and Eve, we have the snake um, also with the knowledge, but not so positive one. Or maybe <laughs> In the interpretation of modern church, it's not a positive one. Yeah. Maybe you can elaborate on this. Uh, oh, oh, and let me tell you something. The, the story of Adam and Eve and the snake doesn't come from the New Testament. It comes from the Old Testament. So it's an old story. It's that snake is a symbol of understanding and wisdom. It's also said here because the snake makes them to discriminate. It may, till then they are naked, and after the snake gives the apple, they suddenly wear clothes because they say, oh, I think God is walking in the garden, so let's dress ourselves with leaves. So the understanding comes. The understanding is two-pronged. One, it is for positive spiritual growth, other is for negative growth. It's not negative growth. When you get too entangled in the world, then the other thing is off. So it's not as if the snake in the Old Testament has been presented as an entirely evil being. It's presented as that which causes you to think. And they said some of the things which are there can't be thought about. Imagine the situation if Adam and Eve were Chinese, what would have happened? <laughs> We've eaten the snake and thrown away the apple. <laughs> What do you do? <laughs> so, these are all allegories. These are all allegories. So you have to look at them very carefully and figure out that a snake has been a universal symbol of uh, wisdom. Even the pharaohs had it on their heads. You see that? And if you read my autobiography, I've mentioned something there about the snakes, about the hooded serpent, not the other snakes. So, there's a connection, so there must be some misunderstanding. I'm not so good at Hebrews. I'm trying to study. I'll tell you after I go through it. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> The New Testament has no reference to this, although Christians follow both. The Muslims also follow the Old Testament, not the New Testament. So we need to look at this carefully. I don't want to give you wrong ideas so, about something that I didn't understand properly. So further research is required. Anybody who knows Hebrew, they can probably go into this and figure out what exactly it means. Hmm? And for us, the snake is a symbol of wisdom too. Even the energy called Kundalini is represented by a snake. 
coil snake. That, uh, when you poke a coil snake, it raises his hood and comes up. Same way. So you say that um, this path is vastly uh, untraveled or unexplored, and that's why the help of a guru and the uh, support of a guru helps us avoid pit. Pitfalls. Pitfalls. So what sort of pitfalls? What, what First, let me make it clear. It's better not to have a guru than end up in wrong hands. Let's make this clear. So, what sort of pitfalls? Pitfalls inside and outside. Like, you might suddenly get enthusiastic about something that is written in a book and start practicing and end up in trouble. If there is a teacher or a guide, it need not even be a guru, somebody whom you can talk to in personal terms, who has already walked on the path, he will tell you, don't do this now, do, it. do this simple thing and then you will come to that. These are some of the outward pitfalls. The inner pitfalls are, if you get into a state of uh, consciousness about which you have no understanding and you are puzzled, if there is someone who has already passed through it, he can help you out with this. He or she can help you out. This is why I meant, that's exactly what I meant by the pitfalls. In fact, even in this there are pitfalls because, example, Suppose you are practicing earnestly yoga and one day you come upon some blissful and tremendous energy and then you discover that you are able to read somebody's mind. Suppose. It's a big pitfall. If somebody doesn't guide you away from that, you'll probably end up doing the same, reading some um, minds and so on. What I have been told is that it's like um, reading somebody's sealed letter. You can't do it. You shouldn't do it. Since we are on this subject, I want to elaborate a little more from my personal experience. That's more important. When I was uh, with Babaji, with my master, Maheshwanath, uh, just the second year when I was with him. Uh, I had this great, uh, um, you can call it desire, yes, to uh, see more than I can see with my eyes. You can only see some things with your eyes, you can't see. I thought there must be something subtle which I can see, like thoughts. And I had uh, heard that thoughts have forms. Forms. So I said to him, Babaji that, uh, oh, is there some exercise by which I can do this? So he said, you really want to do it? I said, yeah, I want to try it. As usual, he said, okay. Thik hai. Thik hai. Okay. So he gave me an exercise and please don't do it. Give me, you can if you like, but uh, he said, uh, he gave me a uh, blackened glass, uh, a glass blackened, which can be kept on the wall, and in front of that, on a, a, lit a candle, light a candle, and then look at the candle and meditate, and a little bit of pranayam, which I don't want to discuss now, some breathing rhythm pattern change. Look at the flame and then after a long time of looking at the flame, I'm supposed to close my eyes and look above the flame at the black mirror. Um, I did this for 20 days or 21 days. When, uh, when I sat there, I didn't feel anything. But when I was not practicing it, one morning I got up and I found some terrible thing coming towards me. So, I, I thought it is a thought form, but it looked like a mixture of, uh, of a crab and a scorpio or something, scorpion coming. I mean, then I knew now this is a thought form which I am seeing. So there must be somebody with terrible thoughts somewhere. 
you know. So I started seeing these things, all kinds of thought forms. Some were good, some were bad. Uh, but all the time, except when I went to sleep, and it became such a burden on me that I... Oh, but then you can find out a person's thought, good or bad, everything you can find out. Colors are also different. But then it was such a big burden carrying this thing around that you are sitting here and talking, suddenly something is coming from. <laughs> I, I, I went to Babaji with folded hands and I said, now how do you get rid of this? <laughs> Please. This is a pitfall. You know what I am talking about. I said, can you, how do we get rid of it? Uh, he said, you wanted it. I said, yeah, but I, I, I didn't know that it is such a big burden. That uh, So uh, how do I get rid of it? You really want to get rid of it? Don't ask me again. Abhi tum mujhe nahi puchoge. I said, nahi, Baba Ji, I won't. I, okay, he said, and gave me one hit on the head. Like, finished. I felt something like a lightning here and tuck, and it was gone. So these are some pitfalls which, oh, another thing. Suppose you're a, you're a young man, right? You start practicing yoga with a certain amount of celibacy and so on. <laughs> Energy builds up. Your face shines. You become very attractive. Very soon, very soon you see ladies around you. <laughs> Pitfall. Watch out. <laughs> I'm not saying that you should hate them. You, you, I hope you understand what I'm saying. You have to because its energy is seen by others and it reflects and especially the opposite sex, they see it, they can feel it. So you have to be careful. It may be nothing, it may be just a friendly gesture, but one has to be careful, otherwise one not end up in trouble. So these are, these are the sum of my favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> From day before yesterday, you have been waiting. I must give you a chance. Yes. Question number two. Question number two is we talk about compassion and the heart chakra. Yes. And I think one of the videos you mentioned from the fourth video, <coughs> you are actually linked to the energy of the yes. heart chakra. Yes. And I come from a country like India and we see a lot of animals which suffer on the street. Yes. Street dogs and some of them are wounded and injured. And I feel I'm not equipped to handle this because you're seeing them on the way to the air, to the train station or whatever. You're just not equipped. I would like your advice on how to deal with this situation. But do you live in India now? I, sorry, sir? Do you now live in India? No, I don't, but then I go over like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a thing that bothers me, and mm -hmm. it's very important for me to know how to deal with this, and I would like your advice. Mm -hmm. These are my two pressing questions for this moment, so thank you. <laughs> I hope we can stop with that for the time being. Okay, so the question of Turiya and Moksha. Now, when you say moksha, the word moksha means liberation, freedom. You catch a young child and keep it in a room, small room, and give everything you want to give, chocolates, sweets, toys to play with. How long do you think the child will stay in the room? One hour, maybe even 15 minutes, it would like to get out. You have experience. It will try to break the window. If you don't open the door, it will break the window and come out. So, the desire for freedom or liberation is inbuilt in all of us. 16, 20 years we are married to somebody, then we want to break out. It's built in. You see? So, I don't want, I'm just saying. I'm free, so I don't want to break out from anything. So, so this Desire to be free, to be liberated, is built into us. We want to do it. It's there in us. So, that is one. That is moksha. Now, 
the ancient sages and those who have experienced it say that when you come to a certain stage of consciousness which is undefinable and which is not uh, finite then you're free because you are no more caught you feel not feel you're everywhere you're not in one place so you don't want to go from here you don't have to do nothing i mean you're free this is the word moksha now the same word moksha is used in yoga and sankhya the word is substituted and kaivalya is used the word kaivalya comes from the root kevala which means alone which means when a person reaches what they are trying to say is when a person reaches that state which we call we just now called moksha he sees that there is nothing but one alone now this alone is actually if you split it it is all one so to see that all one and therefore only one and nothing so this is kaivalya so so moksha and kaivalya are not different and it comes with a great sense of freedom okay now turiya turiya is the word used in the upanishad for kaivalya and for moksha anybody who has touched the turiya which is beyond waking sleep and deep waking dream and deep sleep we discussed the mandukya yesterday and which is the essence and the witness in all these three states but is not caught by any this is turiya therefore turiya moksha and kaivalya according to me from my understanding are the same different terms okay to the second question i really don't have an answer because i feel the same as you feel when we go to india a lot of animals lying down suffering eating plastic sometimes one even wonders is better to take them off than to leave them on the road you know so i don't know how to do this but i do in my own small way i try to help people out to look after them i mean that's all i can do Okay, let me ask you, what you are saying now about it is with language or without language? What now? What you are saying? Language, right? And when you say it's written in Vedanta, it's in a language or a non-language? Language. So while language is important to convey your thoughts, in the ultimate essence, it is of no use. yeah but you need it to express if i didn't know english how will i talk to you? practically yes it's required but it may not reach the supreme it doesn't mean you have to do away with language you should understand that it is beyond words beyond words and for that if i have to say that i have to use words to tell you that right so while well, language is a mode of communication it's not an absolute description that's what i'm trying to say for instance um you can sit down ah all of us think right i think we do <laughs> and we if you look carefully we should all be thinking in a certain language don't we yeah some language yeah, maybe your own language which has come to you or mostly i don't think in english for instance so when you're born in a certain uh, place and then you think accordingly according to how you've been brought up so what i'm trying to say is every thought 
that we have. If all our thinking is in some language or the other. Even if I speak in English, you all, some of you might translate it into Swiss or to German or to French and think, or Italian. So, therefore, what I am trying to say is, we all think in a certain language. But the question now is, is there a thought without language. It's very close to what you're trying to tell me. Ask me. Is there a thought which doesn't have a language? Well, there are feelings which necessarily do not need a language, like anger, fear, <coughs> affection. You describe them afterwards, but when they happen, they don't need a language. One. The other is music. I'm not talking about vocal music, even vocal, <coughs> instrumental. Suppose I'm listening to music, some beautiful music, and you are listening to the same music. You may be from somewhere and I may be from somewhere, but we are all enjoying the music. It doesn't have a language. No, you need a language to learn music. That's a different matter. But music per se does not have a language, it's just the rhythm. And irrespective of what language you speak, we are still enjoying it. So we feel, I feel, that music is a good link, is the intermediary state between language and that which is non-language. Hmm? That is also included chanting and so on. But the ultimate purpose of language is to understand, make us understand that that which we are seeking cannot be described in a language. But even if you had that experience, if you have to convey it to somebody, you need some language. It's a practical. So we need to discuss it. <laughs> Suppose your mind is in Turiya and my mind is we don't need to talk. <laughs> Somebody suggested that we should have silence during the retreats. I was so happy. I thought they were saying, don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> then they said, it's not that. You should talk. And then uh, after the session, when we go out, people shouldn't be talking to each other. But we'll have to work out. We'll have to have an oath on this. Some people can't stop talking. What can you do? Coming, coming. What causes the flow of Maya to come through husband and Can't hear you. What? Uh, question is, what causes the flow of Maya to come between Atman and Brahman? I.e., why does Atman become separate? Ah. That, nobody has an answer to this question. <laughs> the fact is that it is so, and we need to free ourselves from it. That we don't know the reason why it happened does not matter, doesn't mean that it hasn't happened. Right? So, since we are there, let's try to be free of it first. And if you're free of it, you'll get the answer to why and where. The problem is all who are free of it, who have found the answer, have not been able to convey it to others who have not in a language. That's the problem. Uh, Buddha put it very nicely. You don't mind? <laughs> Buddha put, put it very nicely by saying, somebody went into a garden to eat mangoes. I'm glad you're thinking about it. Went to uh, gather mangoes and a hidden hunter hit an arrow and it hit him when he fell down. Here, the arrow was here and it was very painful. Now the Buddha's question was, now at this stage, what is the most important thing to do that you are in pain is to take the arrow out or to figure out ways and means to pull it out so that you are free of pain, right? Or is it logical to lie there with the arrow and think, 
I have to find out who sent this. <laughs> Where has it come from? <laughs> hmm? uh, so you can never do that because by the time you think it out and find out you might have tetanus and you might die. So the first thing is to be equipped to find out this. It's not a theoretical thing. You understand? It's a very personal, important, experiential thing. It's not a... So, first you have to be free. You have to free your mind to explore this matter. That's the first thing to do. So, start moving towards that direction first. And when you are out of that, then perhaps you will know where it comes from. Uh, you'll get ideas. This is food for thought. Think about it. You might come up with something next year we meet. Come again with your dad. <laughs> so, uh, um, when you do that, then you, even if you discover it, it would be more, almost impossible to tell somebody what's happening. It's uh, so, uh, to use another example, it's like uh, a child asked the mother, its mother, Mother, do you really love me so much? Both you and Dad, do you really love us so much? Of course we love you so much. Then why didn't you invite me for your marriage? <laughs> I hope you get what I'm trying to say. Lord Krishna says that he is a Pandava. Um, so he says that the Pandavas did not call him and was waiting outside the door, waiting for them to call to his house. In our normal lives, we go through so much of suffering. We do call the Lord, he never listens. <laughs> what is his role in our life? Problem is, we call the Lord only when we are suffering. <laughs> generally, yes. Mm. It's generally true. Generally, when we are very happy, we don't have to bother about the Lord. Okay, you might light an agarbatti, but... So, maybe the pain is here for you to call. And when you intensely call, it might manifest itself. Sometimes, the logic of the Supreme works in a different way than ours. We think only of this limited life that we have. We don't have an understanding of what was before and what was after. So we usually base our judgments on that. Perhaps something happens to us in a bad way so that we get up and think, no, no, this is not life, there must be something more. What sometimes pains are blessings, you know. You are talking about Uddhav Gita. Uh, I can tell you another story which is similar. These are all stories given for us to understand things. Um, there is a story in which Krishna goes uh, for a walk with um, Uddhava. And as he is walking, uh, first Uddhava refuses to go with him because he is very worried about Krishna. You never know what he is going to do next. So then they go to a place where there is a rich man in a big palace and he asks him, I am very thirsty, can you get me something to drink? So he goes to the palace and the rich man says, oh, wonderful, uh, guest is God and so on and takes him inside and gives him a big glass full of sherbet. So he drinks it and says, this is the best sherbet I have ever had in my life. And then he comes out and blesses the man and says, May he be free, may he become richer and richer, may he be happier and happier. Okay, Uddhava is satisfied, nothing wrong, fine, logical, from his point of view. Had hardly go ten feet, 
when he sees a small hut kutir with a yogi sitting there with a cow and meditating 